And one of the areas that I've been working in for the past couple of years is this area of metrics. And I got interested in it because I've, you know, I've done, written several books on analysis. And uh, write books, write articles, it doesn't mean anybody's going to gather the data to use the evidence to plan and decide what's going to be in. You know, you've got to know your tribe, right? <laughs> you've got to know who the tribe is. It's one thing if you're in the classroom and you start talking and people are clearly <laughs> not there. But online, you're building things, right? Your audiences have choice. And they can choose to be with it, be in it, be writing in it on Facebook or whatever, or tweeting or doing the cases on scenario-based e-learning. Or they can choose not to bother. And in class, when you see they're not bothering, they're wedding planning, they're doing whatever they do, you, you can fix it. You can fix it. I can just go and I can mess with his hair. No, I wouldn't do that. But I could do something. I could lean right in over there. I can, I can, I can do stuff. I'd use an example that I knew was relevant to him. Or I would, I can do things. There are things I can do. I, get, I would get more tangible. I would get more vivid. JT used several examples today. They were very vivid. And you could just see people in the class leaned in. Right? This is just, it, it's good. And you can do that in the classroom. But instructional designers need metrics, need evidence, need to know the tribe, need to know their participants, need to know their audience, need to know their priorities, need to know their fears. Because if they're going to put it up online, they really got to know all this stuff. Because if they hit a, a bad note, out of there. Right? We're out of there. It's, it's got to be so much better than the instructor-led instruction we've built in the past. Because we relied on instructors to fix. And they have. In large measure, they have. So, I got interested in, in this because I'd done so much work in analysis and some work in evaluation and measuring existing assets and programs. And then a, a large accounting firm asked me to take a look at their metrics and what they were doing in all their global learning organizations. Basically, they <laughs> had to get their arms around, we've got all these people out there doing analysis and evaluation or not. What are they doing? Well, you can't just sort of go out and say, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? You have, to, you have to get a handle on what it is. We ran into that today. What is social learning? What is social media? You got to say what it is so you can ask better questions. Right? And historically, when we've talked about this, we've always talked about Kirkpatrick. Right? And what I discovered when I went out and looked at the current literature is there's more to be said and more to be done. Not that it's bad, it's just not sufficient. I thought we'd start with Winston Churchill. I just think it's astonishing that he should be so with it. Evaluation is not working today. Look at this number. Do you think the university thinks it's getting a solid bang for its evaluation box? Now, I don't think it's spending particularly much on evaluation. You know, you go online, you go, but, I mean, do you think we're asking really interesting questions? Or are those questions, is the data then actionable? And yet, any good education organization, and, and I had two experiences, consulting experiences in my life that were so relevant to this. One was a government agency, one was a corporation, and they both were the same thing. Allison, look at the room. Look at all the file cabinets. Now, of course, it's online, but this was file cabinet era. See all the gray file cabinets? You know what those are? What'd I say? I don't know what they are. Evaluation they were the evaluation forms. They were the smile. level ones, the smile sheets. We have so much, la it's like Eskimos and snow language. We, are, we have so much language for level ones. Smile sheets, clap sheets, reaction, reaction sheets, level ones, blah, blah, smiley faces, whatever, whatever they are. Right, they said, guess what? They're all in there government agency and uh, actually it was a telecommunications company. And so I said, oh, wow, yeah, huh. And they said, we aren't doing much with them. I said, much. <laughs> this one woman said, well, let's just say not, we're, we're not doing anything with them. What do, you, what do you think we should do with them? And that was a project I had in both places, which was to make recommend 
make recommendations about how to make the data more actionable. And folks, that's a, an organizational issue. That's a bravery issue. That's a white space issue. That's a strategy issue. You know, they didn't really need an instructional designer to say, if you ask questions like, did you like the instructor? And you ask questions about what was good about the class, what wasn't good about the class. I mean, do we, can we think of what one could do with that data? No, I, don't, I don't think you need a doctorate to figure that out. You just got to decide you're going to do it. Do the thing. Okay, so, I mean, look at this. This number's sad, 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 sad. What about you? What about your organization? I feel confident that there's very few of you who work in organizations where you're using a constant flow of data. But let me tell you who is. The casinos are. And let me tell you who else is. Walmart is. You check out at Walmart, they're asking you two or three questions. I'm asking you 23 questions, because we wouldn't answer them. But two or three questions, oh yeah, we'll answer them. Right? They're using data, and we should be using data. They, this university, every time you go up near the website, ought to pop up a question or two, so they get to know you. We need to know our SDSU tribe. Because then we can serve it better. And then the tribe will be more loyal. And it will give us their firstborn. <laughs> I'm kidding now, but like that. To play for our football team. <laughs> Now I'm just kidding. All right, so there's a lot of dissatisfaction. Look, 20%, this is from the eLearning Guild. This is a 2006 study or five, six study. Look at this, 20% are satisfied with their metrics. 80% not so much. You have these slides. I love this slide. What we measure when we measure. Whose work is this? Who is that? Bob Hoffman knows. Come on. Kirk That's Kirkpatrick's. Yeah. This would be called level one. This would be called level two, level three, level four. And this would be, what year did he produce this work? 1950, approximately. Right. In an era when instruction happened in what form? Classroom. Classroom, like this, just like this. So there was stuff that happened in here, in set in time and place, North Ed 273, December or something, 5.30 p.m., 8.30 back east, different elsewhere. Right, set in time and place. But really, this doesn't matter. What matters is tomorrow and how you can use these ideas. And so, here we are set in time and place, and now we go to the world that matters. Will you do anything differently? Will you decide differently? Will you think about things differently, and then will it do great things for you, for your careers, for your organization, for your unit, whatever, whatever. But to me, that's where the action is, that's what's interesting. And of course, what has technology done? Technology peels this away, right? Learning, information, reference, social media, it's all the time everywhere. There's no more before instruction, during instruction, and the real world after instruction. Now, it's continuous. Yes? And we need to move on. You know, when you talk about the future of the course, the future of the course, of course, is incredibly insinuated into your lives. It's great. I think it's a great thing. So performance support is there. Reference is there. An e-coach is available. So you can do 10, 8, 10 minute scenario based e-learning. You can look at this online and it's got a nice table of contents with it so you can look at the 11 different pieces of it. You don't have to look at all. You look at two pieces that are relevant to a, promo a proposal you're making at the hospital or wherever. Not in the hospital, at the hospital. Look at this. Numbers over here. 90, what's level zero? The biggest number of all, what is level zero? You need to know this, come on. Huh? Attendance, participation. Hits on websites. That's important stuff. And it's the thing we measure most of all. So we assume if the bot is there, the spirit is there. 
big assumption, isn't it? So, I believe we have a new world. I believe we have new metrics, right? For a new world, we have new metrics. What is that new world? Tell me what that new world is. It is 2.0, but it is awareness of what 1.0 is and what authoritative assets are, right? And the fact, look at how their 2.0 presentation, their social presentation, relied so heavily on experts, on authorities. Carrie Will, you just hired one of our alums. Good, huh? That's a good thing. Yeah, we just, I just got an email from her, not Carrie, from the alum, yeah. She yeah, made a wonderful Very choice, huh? Very cool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She had hired her at Sun when she worked with her there, and now in her new company, she stole her. Actually, I guess now, because Oracle stole, she was working for, yeah. All good, all good. So, the new world is more 2-0, more social, both. Blended. Blended, what else? Oh, I'd like to interject for a moment to tell that because of the internet uh, technology, the differences between the experts and the hobbyists and whatever are kind of blurred. Uh, because there's more access to technology, especially in filmmaking and video. Okay, when I started in the mid-90s producing video, computers were expensive and video cameras were expensive and it was usually a very small and elite group. Uh, but now with iPhones, uh, that have the editing software already built in. Anybody can make a film and upload it to the internet and become a star overnight. So it's kind of a blur between the experts and your average show. Totally true. I don't know if I would say it's a bl I would say it's hard to discern. I, th I think that's fair. I think what you just said is fair. Yeah. And I think it's particularly interesting because, I mean, look what they produced. Look, look what they produced, right? They produced an asset. Look at, look at, Performance Improvement Emporium, look at Pino, look at all the things that you produce in your, right? In the old days, in the only Web 1.0 days, you had to have access to a suite of software. You had to go get yourself a, a programmer. You, you know, there was a big distance between us and access to every, the rest of us. And now, he's right, that's exactly what's happening. Uh, the Web 2.0 era isn't just about mixing it up in social ways. It's about all of us being able to publish to the universe, which is really, but that creates issues because it creates a whole lot of crapola that's out there. And I was talking to a guy uh, the other, yesterday, two, two mornings ago. Check this out. Mentor Mob, Mentor Mob, young startup out of Chicago. Um, and what, they've, what they're trying to do is take these social media assets and create, using those assets, create curriculum. So it points you to the place on Facebook. It points you to the YouTube videos. It po and so they're curating social media. So they're trying to basically put guardrails around it to make it a little bit easier for us to get from, we can't just say, I want to learn to make cheese, right? And then, the world is my oyster to make cheese. But the truth is, somebody like me is just going to get overwhelmed and made crazy. And so that's what Mentor Mob's doing. It's using all these free, groovy, social uh, assets and, cr and has a very simple way of slinging them together so, so, and they have a real good back end that keeps track of it. Take a look at it. Yes? I was just say when you were talking about you know, the, now people on their iPhones and things have video camera capability, um, I was just listening in the news that the first feature length film was just made off of a cell phone starring Gina Rollins. Um, oh! Yeah, like, it's called Olive. Yes. Um, so I guess it was made entirely on a cell phone and it's an actual it's an actual movie. I don't know when. It, I don't know if it's well, out already. If it's coming matter out. Matter of fact, they have a festival every year uh, for filmmakers that make films with cell phones. Get out of here. Okay, and she's a widow of I can't remember his last name, but her ex-husband was this independent filmmaker. We're talking about Gina Rollins now. Uh, yeah, who used to do entire films in one house. He would set cameras up and do these two-hour films that were based on dialogue. It wow. Who's uh, afraid of Virginia Woolf? Oh yeah, oh God, that's a hard film to watch. 
Uh-huh. Yeah. It's a hard play to watch. You play originally. Uh, yeah. Um, it was. And that uh, film's a hard film to watch. You look at Richard Burton and you go, oh my God. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a great... But let, just think about that. All right, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Equus. 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 I'm going to see War Horse. These are supposed to be... These are such powerful experiences. Right? We still haven't figured out how just anybody can produce those kind of powerful experiences. Like, I was so interested in the storytelling curriculum you were talking about. You know, how you move to a storytelling curriculum and how you move students through the story. Because you have to have a way for students to know where they are in the storytelling curriculum, right? It's not just telling stories and responding to stories. I mean, they, they ac actually have to be able to do things afterwards. So how, you know, how, do you, how, do you, how do you guide and track and certificate without stifling? It's a nice, t and that it will be the challenge of your careers. Because there's going to be so many options, so many people can produce. So take a look at Mentor Mob as a way to structure things. So this is all new world. This new world means new metrics. It doesn't look the way it looked when Donald Kirkpatrick was doing his thing. This is the way it looked when he was doing his thing. Instructors rule the world. Did you like what the instructors did? Did you like the coffee? Did you like the tea? Did you like the room? Could you pass the test? Can you do it? And by the way, this could be supervision, ethics. It doesn't have to be school subjects. It doesn't have to be K-12. It can be any of it. And this is, okay, let, transfer. Does it transfer? And then the top one, does it matter? Are these results worthy? Was it worth the cost? People always say to me, don't you like Kirkpatrick? I do. I just don't think it's sufficient. I think we require more today. We have other things we're dealing with. Right? Not, we're still dealing with these things. So I want these four plus, plus, plus. So let me show you some of what I've been working on. As we move, the biggest change we've got going on is not 1-0 or 2-0, although that's big far more democratic, authoritative to learner-centric or employees, these are big. But the biggest change I think that will touch you most immediately is classroom to workplace-based or life place space-based, right? So if you're working with nurses in a hospital, it's no longer just getting them in a room and briefing them. It's what can you give them to help them do the job better. That's why, that's why uh, Job aids, performance support, checklists, mobile is so bloody power or short, even short learning scenarios. So powerful. So all of that changes the purposes. And remember, we're consultants, evaluators, analysts, evidence driven people are consultants. And so we're usually working with customers. Sometimes we're the customers ourselves, but mostly we're working with a various array of customers. And so we have to have a way to talk to them about what do you want? Because you can't answer every question. What do you want? You cannot answer every question. So here are some of the questions that I think. I focused on a dozen. First question, who are these people? Who's the tribe? What are they up to? What are their priorities? What are they good at? What, is, what keeps them up at night? This is classic analysis, yes? Number two, all these things we've been delivering, does it fit? Does it work? Why people perform and don't, and what will increase alignment, transfer, and performance? Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Right? That's classic root cause analysis, classic analysis. This is classic metrics. We need to ask this question. How satisfied are people with the learning events and instructors and the on-demand and workplace resources? That is so different than what you see on most smile sheets. And it reflects what's going on today. But it is level one. People make fun of level one. They say level one, poo, poo, poo. Right? Oh, that's just level one. Well, guess what? 
I think level one is more important than it's ever been, not less important. Why do I think so? Because people don't have to stick around. Because they have choice. <laughs> yeah, if they're not seeing it's good, seeing how they can use it tomorrow, seeing how it reflects on where they ran into trouble yesterday and trying to repair or sell or make a decision, out of there. Satisfaction is way critical in a world that's decentered, where stuff is sent out to where, where they get to choose. Sure. Okay, it's the first four. Number five. And remember, this is the basis for conversations with customers. Now, you're going to have some customers who are going to say, I don't have to deal with regulators. I'm doing a, a webinar for ASTD on Tuesday afternoon, uh, morning here afternoon back east and uh, w one of the examples I, I use they don't have to worry about regulators they sell high-end food products all over the world you know fancy fancy cheeses and things they don't have to worry about regulators but the other example we're using is financial services they have to worry endlessly about regulators endlessly so this is an important question for them but not for the other one if learning happened, level two, you wouldn't believe how often people skip this level, that number six. You saw on the Kirkpatrick thing, level, it's level two, 33%. That means two thirds. I remember uh, I was really a young professional. I was doing some work. It was a telecommunications company. And I said, well, if we're going to go do the work with them, don't you think we should do some assessment of whether they learned anything from these classes we're offering. It was all face-to-face -face in that era. And uh, the person who ran the group said, and there was, they came from a variety of cities, and uh, they said, absolutely not. That's not our culture. We don't assess whether they learned or not. Why? That's our culture. It's what we don't do. There's people who say it's what we do. This is what we don't do. Now, they were perfectly good on us giving lots of practices and checklists to help. So they wanted people to learn. They weren't fools, but they didn't want at any point give out the test, do hopefully authentic efforts, which we would then grade and they would then get measured and presumably recorded on it. None of that. You know? That's just, just talking about it here. If we are influencing prize strategic outcomes, of course, that's, a, that's critical. You often have leaders and managers who say, give me that, I want that. I want, here's, the, here's, my, here's what I really care about. These are the two things, these are three. Find that out, find that out. Look at the next one, talent management. Right, we talk, talked about this this, this semester. Attraction, retention, and advancement of individuals in their careers. Number nine, oh, so much we're doing. Oh, so much, a big tally. Number 10, this is big today. The adequacy of our guidance systems. The adequacy of our guidance systems. In other words, are they lost in space? Can they find it? I cannot tell you how often we produce things and they say, too much, I couldn't find it. Findability is a huge issue. Filtering, was it Clay Shirky who says, the problem is in creation, the problem is in production, the problem is filtering. And I do believe that's a big piece of what you all will be doing. You will be curating. There are lots and lots of assets, lots of, How, you gotta make it so people can get to it, can find it, not spend a lot of time on it. If learning turned into action, performance, and habits at work, and number 12, are they on board? Are they a good 2.0 contributor? Are they generously suggesting, commenting, mentoring, coaching, yeah? Okay, so now let's just move forward on this. And you see the 2.0 influences there. And you see the level of detail we're at here. While you see Kirkpatrick's work is influential, you also see that what's going on in our world is perhaps even more so. 
Example. So, this really happened. And this happens all the time. Somebody wants some help with something and they don't have any time and they don't have much money, but they want help. And this is what he said to me in an email. So we switched our trainers to performance consultants, as you know. We did classes for them, gave them some books, some online things. No, this is good. This, this is not bad. He says, I want to know how it's going, if they're growing into performance consultants or not. So I then said, what is this guy really wanting? What purposes should drive my evaluation effort? And it can't be all 12. So I use this with him. And we talked about it. I sent it to him ahead of time. And then we talked about it. And he said, I want all 12. I said, you can't have all 12. I said, you got three <laughs> times the amount of money and twice the, the amount of time. He said, nay, nay. I said, okay, then let's focus on what you really want. And this is what he said, I want them all, but okay, these are the ones I need in the next six weeks, two months. And that's them. I want to know the folks who are doing it well, how come? What's up with them? What's driving their success? I want to know what's getting in the way of those who aren't doing as well. Yes? Or even those who are doing well, I want to know what's getting in their way as well. Right? I want to know how we make them, I want to know what the root causes of success are. So you see a little bit of analysis going on because he wants to figure out the next wave of solution system to put before his people. He also needs to be able to name some successes. He needs to be able to talk about, look what we've done for some of our customers throughout this financial services organization. And finally, this I thought this was interesting. He was interested in the 2.0 world. He wanted to know if they were commenting in discussion boards and blogs, if they were helping each other and mentoring. And, co and I thought that was interesting. I wouldn't have guessed it. That's what he said I want to know. So when I'm at this level of detail, I can go and get this. Can you all see how, you could, how this will structure your inquiry? Yes, can I? Mm -hmm. Now you're going to do it. Okay. You can use no more, you can select no more than 12. You're going to work in twos and threes. You've got five minutes. This is so real, folks. Two hour class. Email etiquette. Two hours. Two, two hour class. That's what, we've, that's what we've been doing at the organization. We have a two hour class in email etiquette. And in the class we have, it's a very good class, very active, but we also give people numerous online examples and policies, which they really enjoy reading. And the class is typically full and it gets really good reaction evaluations, nice. Well, one line leader had the temerity to say to us, I wonder if the emails are any better. Can you imagine? You and your team decide to do a little measurement. Maybe the class could be better yet. Okay? So, I want you to look. Okay? Talk to each other and tell me. You can ask me any questions you want, but tell me what you think where the focus should be. Why don't you just talk to each other, take a minute or two. You got 12, you can't have 12, you can have no more than three or four. <laughs> there you go. Why they perform and don't, fit between what they need and what we deliver if learning happens. Okay, now, you're all sitting there and thinking, well, maybe that's what they always want. Nay, nay, try another one. We'll, we'll do this together. This, I made this up, of course, I make them all up. This is Z Better Mousetrap, a ZBM. <laughs> What was I thinking? Now you might say to yourself, why would she have thought of that? Well, you know, you wander around the web and I saw this funny little picture. I thought, I'll make the, make the whole problem so I can use this stupid little picture. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I used it. It's that kind of deep thing that drives me. <laughs> A deep commitment, not that I've ever touched. Look at this high-tech mousetrap. Give it a look. Right? Who ever had a mousetrap like that? All right, so we, read it, please. 
Our 550 salespeople really got the new product. So we asked them to form a social network with the new people, these are the Americans who got it, with the new people in Canada and UK, right? And so look, to coach the new folks in our pro, I want to know how we're doing with the new sales force and with these new ways of training and development. How are the original sellers doing with their new roles? Okay, so now you tell me, what do you think? Talk to me, huh? Certainly, maybe 11, certainly 12. What else? What do you mean by what are they doing, how are they doing the new role's goal analysis? I, 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 that's the way people talk to you. <laughs> They're not going to speak to you in crystalline phrases. They're going to say, how's it going with my people? Then you got to say, do you mean, do we, uh, do we hold on to them? Do they like it? Are they you got to ask me. You can use these to, to frame up your questions. Is your question, will you stick with us? Do you feel it's good for your career? Or is your question, um, are you satisfied with this way of learning? Uh, you as a mentor and you as a learner, the new people from Canada and the UK. Number two, maybe fit between what is this a good is this a good way to do this thing? This is very much the kind of social learning that our second group talked about today. How's it going? Is learning happening? Is it turning into performance at work? Nobody cares if they can pass a quiz on ZBM. What do they care? Are they selling ZBM? And are they forming relationships and sharing ideas? Because clearly this is some of what was going on. None, probably not too much of this here. Also number three. Yes, uh, number three. Because like, does it take away from the run of work? Yes, that's possible. Possible. And it's possible you're saying in the next month we're going to look at 12 and 4 and 2. And then in the two months after that, we're going to look at six and three. So you got to think, okay, now I know my purposes. The purposes should speak to you in terms of methods. And this is just an example of how it works. So take a moment to look at it. We'll not overdo this here. Does it make sense to everybody? So to see if learning occurred. Error identification, classic instructional design. Look at the indicators. It depends on what we're talking about. Repair is different than sales, is different than uh, community college retention. You gotta know what you're up to here. Look, to, de to determine contribution to prize strategic outcomes. Take a look at Spitzer's work. There's a, a, he does some really nice work. Learning Effectiveness Measurement. Learning, LEM, Learning Effectiveness Measurement. And there's a bibliography at the end of this, so you could take a look at that. He also writes pretty clearly, so you, you might enjoy that. But this one, you can't do this if you haven't done a good job on the analysis, defining what will, what will make you happy. What do you prize? What matters? So you gotta have a good analysis to then measure. But we know this, don't we? We know this. This we know. And look at the kinds of things we care about. Callbacks, errors, customer sat, speedy completion, speedy time to performance. All right? You all read an article for tonight about, what is it? Time to competence. Speedy time to competence. When I was doing some work in it for tonight, when I was doing some work in an insurance company, that was the main thing they were interested in. They didn't want to put new people, and they're hiring many new people now. They didn't want to put them in a long pipeline. They wanted them to be able to get up on the phones and help customers faster. So it just depends what you're talking about here. And they might tolerate a few more errors in order to have people begin to emit the behavior, begin to get, sort of get there. Willingness to share ideas, what was that, number 12? Generosity, contribution. You can look at word clouds, participation, the quantity, the quality, the satisfaction of employees, retention numbers. And then I think that to see if we advance careers of our people, right? Are we helping? So look at these. 
Our career path specified, increase in promotions from within. Promotions from within is a really interesting number. Really interesting number. And when you see that number go down, you just know that inside people are going, Arr. I just was reading something in the Wall Street Journal where people were just, they were exercised because the promotions, there were not significant promotions from within. So this, this kind of uh, summarizes it. I call it marble, and I think it emphasizes uh, my thoughts about metrics. We need more data. We need more sources of data. And more interestingly, we need the data more often. Waiting until the end of 16 weeks, that may be standard here. You know, there might be pushback if you tried to do it more often. But it would be far better to ask two or three questions every week or other week than it would be at the end of 16 when it's too late to do anything about it anyway. More data, more sources, more often. <gasps> Remember that the, the rooms, those two rooms, they were different sized, but they were exact. That gray file cabinet in the back there, multiply that by 30, 40, 50, 60. Chock a block full of data, completely and totally unused, ignored, avoided. Um, the key is actionable. If you ask just a few key questions that your sponsor was keen on, you're much more likely to be able to make it actionable. Mm. Ask about things they're interested in. One of the articles quoted um, the ROI Institute, uh, Jack Phillips ROI Institute, and said how executives are so keen on ROI, on knowing if they're getting results for their, for their dollars, whether it's a good exchange for them. And it's interesting because my, my research doesn't show the same thing. They want to know if it's making a difference. That's not necessarily the ROI question. That's return on expectations, right? That, that's return, am I getting prize strategic outcomes? But that's not necessarily ROI. It's not saying it was a good investment. It's hard to really know that for, right away for sure. But if the training's tied in with, this, with the goals of the organization, then couldn't you make that leap? You couldn't say it was a good return. You could just say it was a good thing. It was a good, good return. My expectations were that they would be able to sell umbrellas. I brought you in to do sales training for umbrellas. Right? And then we had a drought. You're lousy, lousy sales trainers. <laughs> and then we had a flood. Came the deluge. Brilliant. You're brilliant sales <laughs> Umbrella sales train. So, I mean, my point is these things are complex systems, right? Right. But the point I want to make is if you gather data, you need to think about actionability. Is it actionable? And there's three ways it can be actionable. Actionable to help you plan what to do. Those are the typical analysis questions we were talking about on those 12 purposes. Actionable for reporting. Do not kid yourself that you don't have to report. If you build a wiki, don't you want to report on how many people look at the wiki, how many people contribute to the wiki, what feedback they give? Sure. You do a workshop on email etiquette, don't you want to have some sense of what percentage of the organization went to the workshop and then what percentage actually went online to look at the resources? How many repeated? Why are you laughing? You have this at your organization. No, the school that I work at just had a toothbrushing workshop with the kids. Cute! The dentist came in and taught them how to appropriately brush. And how long? It's the big thing is how long, I think. After school. No, no, how, lo no, how long no, you I rush. Didn't, I didn't sit through it, but they were so excited about it. Three minutes I think they got like a free toothbrush or something at the end, so they were like all sold. Okay, let's talk about it. How would you evaluate the workshop? How about satisfaction? Did they like the workshop? They love the workshop. 
So we don't think that's number one on the hit parade. Next time you go to the dentist. Cavities. What else? Breath. Breath? Okay. Talking to the parents. Oh, yes, talking to the parents. And what's the question you're going to ask the parents? Are the kids excited about brushing their teeth? Are they doing it by themselves? Are they doing it? Yeah. Sure. Or teaching someone else in their family. Maybe. Is it, has tooth brushing gone viral? Exactly. <laughs> but no, this is real. This is very, yeah, but okay. So, but if I funded, if I wrote a check to the San Diego Foundation, for the tooth brushing, which I happen to think is it's important. It's not good to not have teeth. It's bad. So you want them to start off with the right number, lose them, and then get more good ones. So you want, this is a good thing. But you, it isn't about talent management, and it isn't about their satisfaction with the experience. Really, this is, did learning turn into action? Habits at home. And did those actions and habits meet the three criteria for good toothbrushing, which is kind of what it thing. It's frequency of and length of. I made this up, but I think that's probably. Mm -hmm. You know why I know this? Because with classes, I, we've done things on, there's all, these online, there's all this online music for kids mm -hmm. to make sure they listen to the music and they brush throughout the whole music so they get the length going. You know this from doing this with your kid. Oh, yeah. Okay, so plan. Report to the funder, to the boss, to the government, whatever. Improve. Doesn't that, isn't that simple? Plan, report, improve. I'm not saying you need to gather data that does all three. But if you gather data and do none of those, that, none of those things, you won't be gathering data for long. You'll have file cabinets or online file cabinets. Do you have to start with a control group? No. No. Heck no. You're not doing, re that's not the kind of, you're not, you're doing an evaluation, judgment of worth. You're not doing research that you ne necessarily generalize to all God's children with teeth. Okay? So, she liked that. I thought it was funny too, but nobody else did. So. Anyway. You want to be able to repurpose your methods and data. So, for example, you would repurpose, this toothbrushing thing is very fertile, you would repurpose, de repurpose dental records, right? You would repurpose the records you had of how much toothbrushing was going on in this little elementary school or big elementary school. Sure. Climate surveys, exit interviews, this is all good data. Sales data, it's all good data. Build in the metrics when you build the programs, right? We're people who use technology. How can you use technology to constantly reach out for little, little gulps of data? Little, little bites. Little bites. Lean little bites. These instruments, and I'm guilty of it myself. I mean, I'm working with Jim on a project right now, and you know, our instrument just goes nattering on and on and on and on and on and on. And it's, you know, of course we have no way to make it, because we're trying to make a client happy, answer, do a lot of things. But Look what Walmart does. When you stroke your card, they ask you two questions, maybe three questions, maybe one question. And look how many people they're capturing that data from. That's so much better than sending people 27 item instruments that they skip. Yeah, Rob. I was gonna bring up real quick, the last time I went to Disneyland, within four minutes of getting within the gate, I was approached by somebody with an iPad that asked my friend and I about 19 questions about Jeez. where we lived, how Serious? we lived, uh, what part of Southern California? It's too many questions, yeah. but it's, it, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking people questions. I think there should be people all over this campus talking to students and saying, you know, how's your parking experience? How's your eating experience? Are your professors nice to you? So oh, oh, somebody should care, no? Yeah. Is that crazy? Why, why is that? they're gonna change. Yeah. 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 Oh, only if the data is actionable. And it could be used to plan. But you know, better than reporting is planning and improving. There's all, plenty of reporting going on. It's in the file cabinets. <laughs> all right, so final, final letter is E for everywhere. We should gather data everywhere that learning information and support go. So it's not just, you know, you finish the class, here's <laughs> the evaluation, and it should be there should be evaluations of onboarding, and there should be everything that happens. And if there are only just two or three or four questions, people like to give you the data, especially if they think you do something with the data. 
Is this not the ultimate? Look at this. If I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six sharpening my ax. I love that quote. Is this not true for you in your lives too? Yeah. Sure true for me in my life. Not that I always do it, but I know I should. Just wanted to share this with you. It has nothing to do with what we've been talking about in particular, but I... <laughs> the of disillusionment, I love that. <laughs> but that up top, this is really interesting. This is the Gartner hype cycle. Hype cycle. And it's about technology, and it, it, it relates to a lot of the things. Let's talk about Second Life as an example. Up there it says visibility. It doesn't say it clearly, but it is up there. Visibility. <laughs> I promise you it says visibility up there. So here we have In Comes Second Life. Ooh, 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 a million dissertations, ecstasy, San Diego State and everybody else buys an island. Everybody's got to have an island. Nobody wants anything in the heartland. Everyone wants an island. Okay. Uh-oh, peak of inflated expectations. Boop, 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 boop. The trough of disillusionment. Look here. Somebody says, you know, there's a lot of way things we can do with that. There I mean, what's interesting isn't the islandness of it or the even the avatarness of it. It's the immersiveness of it. It's the relatively inexpensive, and now you start seeing other tools coming on to create second life-ish experiences. And so here we go, we begin to move, and I'm seeing it, into the plateau of productivity. And that you can think of e-learning. Social media is very much over here. I mean, you just really feel it. it's go, go. I mean, you can hear it, go, 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 go. But when, I, when Jim Marshall and I did this study, there's not so much of it going on yet. It's more like, go, 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 you really ought to shoot out. And it, it, it has possibilities, but it's clearly heading up here. And then there's going to be lots of articles about this. And then it's going to become normalized and ideally standardized in the sense that we, we know what we're talking about when we do it and we have some actual research-based lessons on how to do it better. So I thought you'd think this was interesting. And if you want to read a jaundiced perspective on technology, here's a, I thought that was pretty good. Because we've been talking about it positively. So here's some resources. You can all get to these. Um, so that's it. I promised you 615, Bob. And that's all I had to say. Uh, Your last one. Well, I don't think, it's not exactly my last class. I have another one next week for the doc program. But uh, yeah, it is my last ed tech class. And you should see some of the comments on my Facebook page from students who were in my, there's one from Joe, Joe Williams. He's but way before your time, Bob. He was in my class in 1977 my, when I first came here. Whoa. And he was talking about his experience in it. And Okay, now we, you have to friend us all so we can see this. Yeah, I don't know how to, you tell me you want to be and I'll say yes, it'll be no big deal. I don't think, as long as, uh, there's no problem about that. So that's it. I have nothing more to say. And yeah. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure.